Hello, everyone. My name is Connor Moran. I'm the director of the Wisconsin Book Festival. I want to thank you all um, for joining us this evening to celebrate uh, Linda Sarsour and her new book, We Are Not Here to Be Bystanders. Um, the Wisconsin Book Festival is absolutely delighted to be partnering with Madison College and the Dane County Library Services um, on this event with tonight. Um, it is truly a group effort. Um, it is a wonderful partnership, and it's been incredible to see the way that people have come together to reimagine how we can do things, how we can get together and still get incredible cultural content, um, even while we're not able to get together and get it all at the same time. Um, on that note, I want to thank Madison Public Library and the Madison Public Library Foundation, um, their commitment to all of us um, through the Wisconsin Book Festival and our commitment to bringing uh, incredible uh, author events to us even in this um, time has been unwavering. Um, and uh, I think we've done some really interesting things and we have some um, wonderful events coming up. Um, all of the events will be um, hosted here on our Crowdcast. You can look at wisconsinbookfestival.org um, for more information, I do just want to mention um, that coming up in about two weeks, we are hosting Salman Rushdie, um, and uh, we also have our Lunch for Libraries event, um, which is the only fundraiser of the year for the Wisconsin Book Festival um, with Mark Bittman on the 18th of June. Um, and then uh, we'll be hosting Sarah Broom, who wrote The Yellow House, in conversation with the director of the National Book Foundation. Um, so a lot of really exciting, fun things coming up um, through the Wisconsin Book Festival. So we hope to see you uh, again soon. Um, for the introduction tonight, we have real treats. Um, we are going to hear from Lucia Nunez, who is Vice President of the Office of Equity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement at Madison College, um, and also from a student um, who, <coughs> pardon me, uh, will represent the uh, Muslim Student Association. So um, without further ado, here is Lucia Nunez. Hello. Lucia Nunez, and I'm the Vice President of Equity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement at Madison College. It is these simple two words, community engagement, that brings us together tonight to hear Linda Sarser speak. Our partners in hosting this event are Connor Morang, the Executive Director of Wisconsin Book Festival that you had a chance to meet, Tracy Harold from Dane County Library Services, and specifically the Beyond the Page program. And of course, our Zach Benetta from the Muslim Youth Association. I have to say that Beyond the Page book, book, Beyond the Page program embodies this event perfectly. The website describes this program as a permanent endowment held by Madison Community Foundation that annually funds humanities program in all Dane County libraries program that adds depth to the pages of great books by bringing the authors to Dane County. We will hear one such speaker tonight in her inspirational memoir. The, the Wisconsin Book Festival also adds depth to the pages of the many books by hosting an incredible number of authors. If you haven't read Linda Sarser's memoir, We Are Not Here to Be Bystanders, I recommend it highly. I poured through the chapters this weekend, struck by many of the themes that she brings up. In her book, she describes the bodega her family owned. If you're not familiar, bodega is the Spanish word for a small grocery store, mostly on a corner. Throughout Puerto Rican and Dominican neighborhoods, these dominate, not just in New York City, but all along the East Coast. They serve as gathering places. They have been, they must have been a great influence for Linda in the work she does building coalitions. The other struck, the other theme that struck a chord for me was the quest for dignity and peace. This unapologetically Palestinian Muslim woman from Brooklyn, New York opened a window for me. I look forward to hearing her speech to move beyond the pages of this book. Some years ago, Jimmy Sheffin from our office reached out to the Muslim Business Association and they in turn introduced him to the Muslim Youth Association. These youth publish a powerful newsletter I hope you'll have time to read. I now have the honor and privilege to introduce a high school student from DeForest High School, Zach Bendata of the Muslim Youth Association. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Zach Mandada, and I'm so glad to be with you all today. I am a junior in high school, and I am a, and I'm from the Muslim Youth Association. And the Muslim Youth Association is a Dane County-based organization for the Muslim youth. Members range from 6th to 12th grade, and every month, we publish a magazine called the NYA Journal. In this magazine, we publish articles and interviews with prominent figures in Dane County. Some of these figures are Samba Balde, Masood Akhtar, and Governor Tony Evers. Everything from writing articles to editing and graphic design is done by the youth. The purpose of the NYA Journal and the NYA as a whole is to inform the general public of the lives of Muslims. We write to show that we are all more alike than we are different. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Linda Sarsour. Linda Sarsour is an award-winning racial justice and civil rights activist, community organizer, every Islamophobe's worst nightmare, and mother of three. She's a Palestinian Muslim American born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. She is the former executive director of the Arab American Association of New York and the co-founder of the first Muslim online organizing platform, Empower Change. She's a member of the Justice League NYC, a leading force of activists, artists, youth, and formerly incarcerated individuals committed to cr criminal justice reform through direct action and policy advocacy. Most recently, she's one of the national co-chairs of the largest single day protest in US history, the Women's March on Washington. She has been named amongst 500 of the most influential Muslims in the world, and she has won numerous awards, including Champion of Change from the Obama administration. She was recognized as one of Fortune's 50 greatest leaders and featured as one of the Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world in 2017. She's a frequent media commentator on issues impacting Muslim communities, Middle East affairs, and criminal justice reform, and most recognized for her transformative intersectional organizing work and movement building. Please help me welcome Linda Sarsour. Thank you so much, um, Zach. I appreciate you. Assalamu alaikum to you and peace be upon all of you. I wanna really thank uh, Madison College um, and the Wisconsin Book Festival. Thank you, Connor. Thank you, Lucia, for that beautiful introduction um, and it's such a, a wonderful experience to get you meet to meet you even virtually. I want to give a shout out to Jimmy, who I've had a great opportunity of meeting um, as well. So thank you all for having me, and I hope and pray that one day very soon I'll get to be in space with all of you. Um, you know, first I want to talk about a little bit why my book, um, and this is my book. We are not here to be bystanders, and it's actually came out at the right time. And I think that everything happens for a purpose. This book that I wrote was um, really an ode to my community, an ode to my family, and something that I believe that I owed to my children and to future generations of Muslims to come. This is a book about uh, survival. It's a book about organizing and building allyships. It's a book about power, people power. And it's something that I fundamentally believe in. I believe in the power of the people. I believe in the power of coalition. And I also believe in the power of individual interactions. I believe that you can truly transform someone's heart in a face-to-face -face interaction. Maybe even someone who would never ever agree with you uh, on, you know, politically, ideologically, on issues of faith, but just to meet you and to get to meet you as a human being, I think that can be really transformative. You know, the title of, of my book is We Are Not Here to Be Bystanders. And it's how I've lived my life as an adult for the last 20 years. I truly believe that we are not here to be bystanders to injustice. And we're living um, at a time where maybe some decades from now, we'll look back and say, we're, what, were, what were we doing? Who were we? Who did we choose to be at this time? We're living history right now. And when I think about not being a bystander, and I ask for all of you to reflect on this moment, you know, we're living at a time right now where so many people across the country have lost loved ones to this pandemic. There are there are people who have uh, no access to health care in our country. There are people, 37 million Americans who have lost uh, their jobs, um, which means that they probably also lost their health care um, because of an, an, an inept administration. Uh, we have lost our loved ones. We've been mourning um, for the last uh, some for the last two and a half months. Uh, you know, not being bystanders to the stories that we hear every day, um, the uh, incidents that happen around us that are not in a vacuum. When we think about the uh, cold-blooded murder of someone like uh, Ahmad Arbery, a jogger in Brunswick, Georgia. When we think about the murder of Breonna Taylor uh, in 
Louisville, Kentucky, an EMT worker, someone who was at the front lines of COVID picking up sick people from their homes and taking them to local hospitals, who was uh, gunned down by uh, Louisville Metropolitan Police because they were raiding her home looking for, looking for someone that hadn't lived there in three years. And because of that, a beautiful, brilliant black healthcare worker uh, lost her life. When we think about the uh, attacks on our voting rights, you know, there are people in our country in a, the land of democracy who uh, are not able to cast their vote for many reasons, whether that means that uh, Republicans and others in opposition are closing polling sites in the poorest, blackest and brownest communities in this country, whether that means an administration that opposes vote by mail in the middle of a pandemic, um, the continued uh, 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 pushing of voter ID laws and trying to put as many obstacles in the ways of poor working class black and brown communities so that they won't have the opportunity to participate in democracy. Whether that's the continued attacks on women's reproductive rights. If you look across the country, you can watch administrations, uh, gubernatorial administrations, you can see the state legislators who every day are finding new and creative ways to attack women's reproductive productive rights, to strip women of our right in America to have agency over our own bodies, to, to literally roll back things that women before us literally fought, some died for. Um, and here we are in, uh, in 2020 fighting for the same things that our mothers and grandmothers were fighting for. When I think about not being a bystander to the Muslim ban, and, uh, and oftentimes there's arguments about the Muslim ban. Is it really a Muslim ban? How could it be, Linda, a Muslim ban if it's only now 15 countries? And I ask my fellow Americans, I even ask you know, members of my own community, how many Muslim countries have to be on a list of countries that are banned of people being able to immigrate to the land of freedom and opportunity? And, and, and what is going to outrage us? You know, what, what has to happen? How many countries, which country has to be on the ban list in order for us to stand up and say, enough is enough, this is not okay, this is not who we want to be uh, as a nation. I also think about the children at the border. I think about the children who were separated from their families. I think about the current choice that our administration is putting to families who are in detention together, telling mothers, listen, if you really care about the well-being of your child in this pandemic, you have a choice to make. You either stay here and risk the chance of your child and you getting COVID or you can give up your child and we may give them up to a relative, we may give them up to strangers, we may give them up for adoption. And knowing that you may never see your child again, put that psychological warfare that we're playing on immigrant families and those who are migrating to our country who probably would have loved to stay in their home countries. No one wants to leave their home, but because of dire circumstances, they have chosen to come to our country and we have made the decision to close our doors, to close our hearts and to close our minds to these people. I say to people all the time that it's not easy to make decisions uh, around not being a bystander. Unfortunately, we have had many moments in this country where majority of Americans were bystanders. And I don't want to repeat those types of histories. And I'm going to take you through some. And many of you are here because you are people who are well-learned, you, you, you know these things. But it's, it's good sometimes to remind ourselves the country that we live in and the mistakes that have been made in the past and the people that we've hurt in the past so that we don't make those mistakes again. And so when I think about not being a bystander, I think about my fellow Americans at a time when I was not here, um, you know, the, decided to be bystanders to uh, the, the, the Chinese Exclusion Act, you know, the, the people who were bystanders uh, to this idea that we can ban a whole group of people from China to not immigrate to the United States of America. The, the, the people who were bystanders to, to the, uh, the, the Jim, Jim Crow laws, which I would argue exists today, segregation, this idea that we lived in a nation that segregated people by race. And now we're in 2020, and I'm sure you see this in places like Wisconsin, we are segregating people by race and class in many parts of the country. I live in New York City, which has one of the most segregated public school systems in the entire United States of America. We, our fellow Americans were bystanders to Japanese internment. And Japanese internment was uh, at a time when uh, our government decided that they would go and around to the homes of Japanese Americans, our fellow Americans, you know, people, you know, our great grandparents, neighbors, and literally take them and their children and put them into camps on this US soil. That happened not because they were just evil people 
um, in our government who made those decisions to terrorize these communities, it was because of bystanders. It was because the majority of Americans somehow believed that this was the right thing to do. They, did, they didn't make uh, the decision to stand up as a majority, as a super majority to say, I'm not gonna be by a bystander. We're not going to be bystanders. So this is the type of, 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 of things that have happened in our history and it continues to happen. We can look right now at, at the mass deportations that we have seen in the last few years. Over 1000 immigrants um, have been deported every single day for the last almost uh, 10 years. Um, this is not just a, a product of the uh, current administration that we have. This is unfortunately was happening in, under previous administrations, including democratic administrations. Uh, we have uh, overall stood but to being bystanders to a mass incarceration, which really is modern day slavery. As an American, we should be thinking about why is it that you know, we live in America in the land of democracy and we hold 25% of the world's prison population. Uh, how could that be? How could it be that we are the United States of America? We have about 340 million Americans that live here or 340 residents in the United States of America. But when we look at countries like China that has a billion or India that has a billion, there are other very populated nations. How could it be that we, the United States of America, hold 25% of the world's prison population? And that really is about uh, uh, bystanders. It's about you know who challenged uh, in those moments. And of course, there were frontline activists. Of course, there were people that were advocating and people who lost their lives fighting against these horrific policies um, of, 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 of our government across time. And of course, one of the biggest atrocities um, that we've seen um, in this country on the land that we live uh, is the, the extermination of indigenous people. I live in, in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, and I know every single day that I'm walking on a land that was occupied or that belonged to, uh, excuse me, belonged to, it's their land, um, the Canarsie Indians. And that was the tribe that was uh, living in literally the place that I live right now. And I acknowledge that I walk on their land. Now, people say, I get it, Linda, you know, I don't wanna be a bystander to injustice. I understand injustice, I see it, it hurts me. I don't want it to, to happen. And one of the biggest reasons why people don't uh, stand up with why people don't kind of risk uh, standing up against injustice is because it's not easy. Um, and oftentimes it has a lot of consequences. And oftentimes, even when we think about folks before us, those who did decide not to be bystanders, even in our current time, the way we talk about them is whitewashed. We don't actually think about the things they had to endure, the, the actual experiences that they had, and really what they truly actually believe. And one big great example that's pretty universal amongst our communities and movements is Dr. Martin Luther King. You know, a lot of times when I hear people talking about Dr. Martin Luther King, they talk about him in ways that really disturb me, in ways that, that really, um, you know, make me feel like we're not really encompassing the, the a whole man that he was and the whole movement that he was a part of. And oftentimes Dr. Martin Luther King is used against modern day activists and activists of today used against us, um, you know, to make us feel like we're not doing it right or we are not doing it in the same legacy. I personally am trained in Kingian nonviolence and Kingian nonviolence um, is an ideology. It's a way to show up to standing up against injustice. And it's the ideology of Dr. Martin Luther King and his movement. You know, Dr. Martin Luther King has been portrayed to many as someone who was, you know, very, um, you know, calm and he, he, he was all about unity. He was all about, you know, bringing the white people and the black people together. And he's, he became this kind of um, figure uh, that, uh, that really for me was not who he was and it wasn't the essence of who he was. In fact, Dr. Martin Luther King was a man who uh, radically loved black people. His whole mission uh, of his work in the civil rights movement was to push our country to res respect and to embrace black people as full human beings. And of course that required for him to work with white allies, but that was not his mission to bring white allies and bring black people together. Dr. Martin Luther King was a black radical revolutionary. He was a man who never wrote you letters from the uh, some oval office somewhere or some you know ivory tower. He wrote you letters from the Birmingham jail. He was a victim of police brutality. He was uh, targeted by the FBI. In fact, if you all know the history, the FBI tried to coerce him into committing suicide. 
you know, this is a man whose organizations that he was a part of were blacklisted by the U.S. government. That is who Dr. Martin Luther King is. So for me, that is how I show up and how I think about organizing and how I think about movements, that we have to sacrifice, that we, when we choose not to be bystanders to injustice, those who are committing the injustice are going to target us. We're going to have people who will disagree with us. Remember that during the time of the civil rights movement, there was a, a, a survey that was done, a Pew survey, and it said that 66% of Americans did not agree with the goals of the civil rights movement. So that's the, that's the moment that we live in right now. We've seen opposition to the Black Lives Matter movement. We've seen opposition to women's reproductive rights. We've seen oppositions to immigration pathway to citizenship. We've seen opposition to a whole range of issues, law enforcement accountability. The minute you start critiquing law enforcement and their policies, what happens? People will say you're anti-law enforcement, you're anti-police. So we're re literally repeating history. And I think we're at a moment right now where we have the opportunity to all make the decision not to be bystanders, to accept the consequences that come with standing up because being silent has far more consequences. I often say to people all the time that silence for me is a form of violence. If you see your neighbors being targeted, if you see your neighbors being oppressed, your silence, your turning away and saying, look, in my heart, I know that's wrong, but I'm not gonna do anything about it. That makes you culpable to the injustice that's happening. You know, another another uh, part of my book that's really important to me, and it's a concept that has come up often in the movements that many of us are a part of, is this idea of intersectionality. Intersectionality has now been like the topic of panels, the topic of conventions. People use it all the time. And I don't always un understand, or I'm not always reassured that people actually understand what intersectionality is and what is intended by using the term and what does it look like in practice. You know, intersectionality um, is uh, a, co a term coined by a wonderful, brilliant, black, radical scholar, um, feminist scholar, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw. And she was very specific about what she meant about uh, intersectionality. And it's actually a theme in my book, this idea that, you know, when we're fighting up against injustice, when we're fighting against oppression, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw basically says we cannot just fight one form of injustice at a time, that we have to learn how to organize across oppression, and that is what intersectionality is. It's the idea and the, and the practice of, uh, you know, if we're going to combat anti-Black racism, then we're also going to have to combat uh, sexism and misogyny and homophobia and transphobia and Islamophobia and anti-Semitism and, and ableism. It's this idea that we, also understand that people are intersectional human beings, that you can be a black, trans, uh, woman, working class, so you have multiple identities. And there should be never a space that tells you to leave one part of your identity out, that people should bring all of themselves to every movement. We can't talk about racial justice without talking about environmental justice. You can't think about Flint, Michigan, and looking at the lack of access to clean water for the people of Flint, Michigan, without talking about racial justice, without talking about classism and about environmental injustice. This is the kind of work that I do and what I try to portray in my book by taking you through narrative, by taking you through storytelling. And that was important to me. Storytelling is a very important part of the work that I do. You know, oftentimes people want to show up they want to be part of the work and they just don't know how and and, and it is a responsibility of those who are leaders in academia you know people who run community-based organizations leaders of churches and mosques and synagogues and temples um people who run you know book clubs i mean people just want uh avenues they want you know points of entry you know not everyone's going to be a full-time activist and that's okay um, but everybody can show up. Everybody has an opportunity and a role to show up. I say to people all the time, look, there's nothing extraordinary about me. I'm a Brooklyn born daughter of immigrants from New York City. I'm a mom, I have three kids. I went to New York City public school system my whole life. You know, my father was a small business owner. My mom was a housewife. I was the oldest of seven children. At the age of 10, I was already the oldest of seven children. So I was one of those very responsible young people um, who was helping my mom. I was my mom and dad's social worker. I was their translator. Um, and I had a lot of responsibilities and a lot of young people these days have responsibilities. Many young people are going to school. They're also working um, to help their families. Uh, and that was kind of my journey. And so to, that's just to say that, you know, 
anybody can show up anybody can do the work and to take you a little bit on the journey of the women's march which i do share a little bit about um in my book i didn't want my book to be about donald trump and the women's march because i am number one much more than that i was an organizer many many years before there was a women's march and in fact my very many years of organizing and my track record in organizing and mobilization is what contributed to the success of the women's march uh on washington and also uh, you know, Donald Trump, a lot of people, you know, the day after elections and to, to take you on a journey a little bit about the Women's March, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, on the day after the election, and I know I felt the same. So this is not a judgment. This is me feeling, you know, I was part of, you know, like everyone else, I couldn't believe my eyes. I couldn't believe that my country betrayed me, that this man who had won an entire election on the backs of Muslims and refugees on the backs of black people and immigrants and LGBTQIA people and disabled folks like this is a man um, who uh, literally uh, practiced every form of, uh, of phobia every form of racism and then he was elected to the highest office of this land and I know many people were devastated that a, a sexist a misogynist um, someone who had been accused of, of rape and sexual harassment and sexual assault could get the highest office in this land but the day after the inauguration, that devastation caused a lot of other people to join us and join our work and join the movements we're a part of. And I wanted to remind those people at, as part of my participation in the Women's March that, look, there was sexism, misogyny, anti-black racism, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, homophobia, you name it, it was here before there was ever a Donald Trump. And you know, we, myself um, and Tamika Mallory and Carmen Perez, who uh, many of you know were three of the four co-chairs of the Women's March on Washington, uh, us three women, we knew each other before. We're all trained in Kingian nonviolence. And one of the things we came to the Women's March to share and to teach um, is Kingian nonviolence and the six principles of Kingian nonviolence. And I hope this one principle sticks with all of you in the ways in which you wanna show up. One of the principles of nonviolence, which is the ideology again of Dr. Martin Luther King is attack the forces of evil, not the people doing evil. And so the, what that means for me is I'm not going to continue to attack uh, Donald Trump specifically as one man, I'm going to attack the forces in which that Donald Trump represents. And so that means that we're going to fight anti-black racism, we're going to fight xenophobia, we're going to fight homophobia and transphobia and Islamophobia and anti-Semitism and ableism and sexism and misogyny. Those are the forces of evil that we all have to be united around. And, 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 that, and I also came to the Women's March to share and I became a very uncomfortable leader in the Women's March. And people don't like to be around people who challenge them. And it is important for us to keep open minds. One of the other things that I taught in the Women's March Network is unity is not uniformity. And there is no way possible in a country like the United States of America, and even sometimes on a very diverse college campus, there's no way that we could be working towards a goal that we're all somehow going to be uniform and united on every single issue. It's not possible. We're not all the same people. We didn't all grow up the same. We come from different working class backgrounds. We are, some of us are immigrants, some of us are children of immigrants, some of us are indigenous to this land. Uh, we just have different experiences. Some of, the, some, of, some of us may have been targets by law enforcement, others have never had that experience. Uh, so there are, there's so much, there's, we, we hold different identities. You know, I'm a Muslim, Palestinian, American mom, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. I, I have a working class background. And so of course, I'm not going to always agree with a woman who may be white and maybe living in the suburbs of you know new jersey or living in the suburbs of arkansas maybe someone who's a physician maybe someone who has much higher degrees than i do we're just not going to always agree and so coming to the women's march and being able to kind of form or or make the attempt to right the wrongs of the past feminist movements that have come before us to build an actual intersectional feminist movement that says linda belongs tamika belongs bob bland belongs you know, Areles belongs, you know, Yonazda belongs, everybody belongs, is, is, is something that we still have a lot of work to do. You know, coming to a place of understanding that unity is not uniformity, that we could be united around principles, that we can work together in places that we agree, and we could choose not to work together in places where we don't agree. And that's the kind of maturity that we need in this moment to make the decision that we're not gonna be bystanders in light of all the injustice that we see happening, not only around us here in the United States of America, 
but that's happening around the world. And so what does that look like when you know, you're talking to your sister, to your grandmother, to your friend, you're talk, trying to organize other college students, you're trying to organize faculty. You know, sometimes people will say, look, I'm a college student. I have a lot of homework to do. I got a lot of papers to write. I got a lot of studying, Linda, I'm with you. I agree, there's a lot of injustice, but I don't have the time. You know, faculty will say, look, I'm teaching four classes. I'm grading a lot of papers. You know, a lot of times people are trying to share with us the, the you know, their, their life and their schedules. And I agree that there are people who have overwhelming schedule. You may even have children and are working and, and a lot is going on. Even in this pandemic, people are now, not only are they maybe college professors or maybe working at home in other jobs, but they're also homeschooling their children. But I always say to folks, there's always something that you can do. And so I wanted to share with you some very easy things that I always tell people and give people some perspective to think about. Showing up is the easiest thing that we can all do. You know, oftentimes, you know, when I mobilize people, I'm very traditional organizer. I know a lot of people see me on social media. They think I have an influential following and they think that I organize and mobilize using social media. Of course, social media is a platform that I'm using and it's available to my generation, but I'm an old school organizer. I still pick up the phone, I still call people, I text people, I email people. And, and for me, uh, when I think about um, moments of action or there's a protest that's happening or there's a woman in my community who's about to get deported and we're trying to mobilize uh, for her, people will say to me, Linda, you think that someone's gonna miss me being there? You know, and people think don't don't think about their individual power. They think about it in the in in terms of a group. Like there will still be a protest without me. But I always remind people about the Women's March on Washington, the largest single day protest in US history. One plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one times a million makes that a million women that were just in Washington, DC. We had two and a half million people across the United States without Washington, DC. So altogether in the United States, we had three and a half million people on the streets of America, which is about 3% of the US population, which is a very big deal. Then we had across the world, we had 5 million people join us across the world. So don't ever sit and hear that there's going to be a, mo a mobilization or a place for you to show up to stand in solidarity, or maybe it's something that's directly impacting your community and always realize that you have individual power, that yes, your presence is important, that, that sometimes even as a Muslim American, being able to show up as a woman in a hijab to stand in solidarity with a, a, a black community who has just been directly impacted by a police killing, that means a lot to uh, me to show my solidarity, not just on social media, but in person. So show up when you can. And don't ever say no one's gonna miss me. I promise you, people will appreciate you showing up. And solidarity is not just something that's important and something that's beautiful, it's necessary. Solidarity in this moment, us showing up for one another, us saying back off the Muslims, back off the refugees, Black off, back off our immigrant communities, back off LGBTQIA communities. This is important. This is our, about our survival. So showing up is very important. Obviously, now that we're, you know, we, we, we we're in a, a time where there may not be an opportunity to show up in physical spaces. You know, show up in online spaces. Make sure you're using your social media to show up, to show solidarity uh, to communities who are being directly impacted. You know, people don't like to hear this part, but donating. I know donating sounds, you know, especially uh, in a time right now where um, there are a lot of people who are unemployed, a lot of people who are struggling, um, but there are some of us who are fortunate, some of us who have continued to be able to have our jobs and move forward. And of course, not a, we don't always have a lot of money to give, um, but resources are important, especially to grassroots local organizations. And I remember being on college campuses and talking to college students who always say, Linda, are you serious? Like, I'm a college student. Like, I don't have money to donate to organizations. And I would ask college students, I say, did you buy a cup of coffee today? There's a Starbucks downstairs um, in your campus, or there's a Starbucks down the street on the corner. And young people will say to me, well, Linda, that doesn't count. I need to have my cup of coffee. I, got, I get a latte every morning. You know, a, a average you know, price for a latte these days is $4, $5. And sometimes people are getting them five days a week. And there's actually no judgment there. Sometimes, you know, I get it seven days a week. You know, it's, it's actually one of my self-care. So it's, it's part of like, something that I see I get for pleasure and so I always say to folks like even if we all decided that one day a week we were going to give up that cup of coffee and we were going to take the five bucks that we spend and put it back in our pocket 
And that would mean that every month we would have $20. Imagine if we were a sustained donor to a local grassroots organization, that every month we were giving $20 to a grassroots organization. Now imagine if there were 50 of us doing that for the same organization or 100 of us doing that for the same organization. These grassroots organizations that are on the front lines of environmental justice, racial justice, immigrant rights, protecting the rights of refugees, of voting, voting rights, people who have food pantries, um, really doing the, the grunt work in our community. These are people who could do a lot with a little. So even having $1,000 a month or $2,000 a month that comes from their local community of people giving them $20 a month uh, could truly be transformative for them. So never feel like you don't have enough. You know, again, $5 a week is enough for an organization uh, and for a local organizer or for an initiative or a campaign that you care deeply about. You probably knew that I was going to come uh, to this point. And I don't like telling people what to do. Um, I, I never also will tell you to do something that I myself wouldn't do. If I, if as you have seen my work, if I'm going to tell you to uh, in, go show up to a protest, either I organized it or I'm going to also show up myself. If I'm going to talk about electoral organizing, I have be, I'm going to be the one phone banking, door knocking, you know, doing the work before I ask you to do it. And so we're coming up on a you know a, a very important election, um, and this election is uh, going to be important to our generation. It's going to be an election that's going to be talked about for generations to come. And we also have to realize that this election is not just about a presidential election and another way that we could show up and every individual can do this is we have to number one be registered to vote that's very important and i always say to people and this is not to shame people it's to say that and this is a fact and it's just something that we have to sit with there were generations before us who literally died who literally shed blood on the streets of the united states of america so that we could have the right to vote so that my immigrant parents can come from another country work their way up and get their U.S. citizenship and register to vote. It's because someone before them, particularly black people in America who literally died uh, and, and were beaten with uh, clubs and were uh, hosed down so that we could have the right to vote. So think about that. Um, if you're not registered to vote, please register to vote. That's something every single individual who is eligible and is over the age of 18 and is an American citizen can do. And also, a lot of people may be disappointed in this election and the choices that we continue to have every four years. And I understand that. But I always tell people all politics is local. Don't worry about what happens in a presidential election. Who's running for Congress in your area? Who's running for state legislator? Who's running for city council? Who's running for uh, ombudsman? Who's running for you know school board? They're every single office, all the way from what you believe to be the lowest office to the highest office. The most impactful thing, the things that you will feel, the direct, impact of are actually the people who are at the most local of offices. So right now, let's just say you're not excited about this election. Um, and what I would do is take the excitement that I had for whatever candidate you loved and supported and put that in a local candidate. That means, you know, finding two hours a week to phone bank for, for a candidate that you love, someone who aligns with you, someone whose principles and values align with you. Phone bank for them, text for them, uh, donate to them. Find ways to participate. You know, help your neighbors. Uh, you know, maybe request absentee ballots if you're if they're worried about going to the polling sites. You know, there's a lot of things that you can do when it comes to uh, voter engagement and, vote and civic engagement. This election is very important, and one of the things I've been calling people to is this idea of the collective. You know, I come from a culture, and many people come from cultures like this, where, um, and you've heard these types of. Um, uh, Proverbs said before where it takes a village to raise a child. I actually come from a culture um, uh, as a Palestinian that believes in the, this village mentality. You know, we come from different villages. That's how we know one another. When we go to when we, we go to different Palestinian communities, people, the first thing people will ask you is, what village are you from? And the reason why I bring that up is because in, in my culture, what I'm taught is it's not about me as an individual. It's not about my personal feelings. It's about how are we doing? How is my village doing? How are my neighbors doing? And, and that's how I want you to think about this election. I want you to think about this election from the collective that, that maybe you may not be excited about any particular candidate at the highest office, but you know what? Cast the solidarity vote. You know, we have to understand that 
this election is a matter of life and death for some communities. Um, there are communities who will say, yes, we have experienced oppression before this administration, but we also know that it's going to get worse under this administration if we continue to allow them to stay in office. And so I'm asking you to think about your vote, you know, and to think about uh, people and your vote. So, for example, you know, I think about going to the polls and I'm excited to go to the polls. I think about, you know, casting my vote for my black neighbors in New York, you know, that have been directly impacted by over policing. Um, I want to cast a vote for my undocumented neighbors who are not going to be able to participate in democracy. I want to uh, cast my vote for my friends and family who are uninsured, who don't have access to health care. I want to uh, cast my vote for the people of Flint who still don't have access to clean water. I want to cast my vote for the people of Palestine and the people of Iran and, and for people across the world who continue to be impacted by our foreign policy, by the sanctions that we continue to, uh, in, you know, in retaliation that we have to governments who uh, may be horrific dictatorial regimes, but you know, the impact that we, if it's had on ordinary people around the world. Um, and so that's who I'm going to vote for this election. And I want you to think about that. You know, don't be a bystander this election. Don't make the decision that you're not going to participate. I want you to go to the to the to the to, to either to the polling site or get an absentee absentee ballot and make sure that our Congress is progressive, that our Congress is, uh, you know, has more women and more people of color and more people from marginalized communities that are represented. Uh, so that's that's another way we can all show up. You know, that's an individual responsibility. It doesn't require anyone else. And if you really want to be super, um, you would find ways to ensure that you can get five other people to engage in this election, you know, five other people to, to vote, whether that means you're taking them physically with you to the polling site or getting five people in your family or friends to request their absentee ballots. Um, I'm going to end with a story um, that happened to me uh, a couple of years ago that really illustrates um, for me uh, what what this idea of not being a bystander means. Um, and and it, it was something that was very touching for me that happened at a Cleveland State University where I was doing a lecture. And at the end of the lecture, a young Muslim boy from the Muslim Student Association stood up to ask me a question. And he said to me, Sister Linda, I want to know who was living in America at the time of Japanese internment. And he just abruptly sat down. And I, at the moment, I didn't even know how to answer the question. And I kind of just stood in place. And then a few days later, I was in my office in Brooklyn, New York, and this young man's voice came to me. And, you know, I said to myself, I know exactly who those people were. I know exactly who the people who were living in this country at the time of Japanese internment. They were the silent majority. They were the bystanders. And the reason why the Japanese internment in particular speaks to me and to many Muslims is because if you think about Japanese internment, that was only about 78 years ago. Uh, so there are still people alive amongst us um, in our country who remember that time. In fact, um, a former Congressman Mike Honda uh, from California who's still alive today, he was a toddler when he was taken with his family and put into one of these camps. And if you remember the story of Japanese internment, it didn't just kind of happen. It wasn't just like a one day somebody woke up and said, what a great idea I have. Let's go around and, and, and round up our Japanese uh, residents or, or citizens. What happened was years and years and years of propaganda. Um, it was years of, of telling the American people that Japanese Americans were not to be trusted, that the Japanese Americans could not be loyal to the United States of America, that the Japanese Americans were the enemies within. And it was featured so many times on national television, there was so much propaganda on the radio and in the newspapers that eventually a lot of Americans believed that and they believed that they were in fear of their Japanese neighbors. And eventually the US government decided to round up Japanese Americans and put them on camps, oftentimes saying it's for their own safety. And the reason why that moves me when I think about not being a bystander right now is if you fast forward now till 2020 and to the immediate aftermath of the horrific attacks of 9-11 in the last 20 years, it really is the same playbook. If you think about what's being said now, um, you know, the Muslims are not to be trusted. The Muslims are incapable of being loyal to the United States of America. Islam and the constitution are not compatible. You know, the Muslims are the enemies within. We need to put forth policies to protect the American public from Muslims and the Muslim terrorists. 
And I say to people all the time, what makes me as a Muslim more honorable than a Japanese American? What makes me think that I'm going to be immune from a potential atrocity like the rounding up of Muslims in America by this or any future administration? And I think that was what that young man was asking me that day. And it was in that time that I reaffirmed myself that I would never be and I will never be a bystander to any injustice happening against any community. And I hope that you all read my book and you all reaffirm and you declare that you will never be a bystander to injustice. And that being a bystander to injustice is being, in my opinion, just as culpable as those doing the injustice. So I want to thank the folks at Madison College and the Wisconsin Book Festival for having me. And I look forward to um, Connor um, and, the, and the question and answer portion of this evening. So thank you all very much. I'm the only one they can hear clapping, but you know, I'm sure that all, all 100 people are there clapping. Um, I do want to um, thank you so much, Linda. Uh, yeah, there, that's lovely. Um, I just want to say thank you for this book and for um, such a lovely talk. We do have a couple of questions. I have a couple of, if um, we still have time, but um, I think the first thing that I um, wanted to ask is uh, there's a person in the audience who says that they have a five-year-old and they talk to their five-year-old about social justice and um he sees them do things in that realm and then also sees what other people in the family or other people um close to them do um and because you have older children this person's wondering if you have any advice on how best to navigate situations um, that involve our children and how how to you know inspire them and explain to them um kind of how this how this works and mm -hmm. I really appreciate that question. Um, you know, I was a young mom. I was an um, 18 year old mom and I kind of grew up with my own kids. So we've been on a journey together and whether it's unfortunate or fortunate, but my kids have also had a front row seat to the work that I've done and to the issues that I work on. One of the mistakes that us as parents make sometimes is we always think that our kids are too young and we wait too long to teach our kids about injustice. You know, we wait too long to teach our kids about racism. And we think that these concepts are much bigger or too mature for our kids. And in fact, young people and particularly kids, five-year-olds, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds are actually really profound and they're actually deep. And oftentimes when I've talked to, I've talked to the youngest kids like at Islamic schools and I would go and you know, it would be funny because the school would bring me to talk to the middle school and the high school age. And then I would say, what about the first graders? And I always say to them, they're like, what do you mean first grade? And I'm like, yeah, I want to talk to the first graders. And I would talk to them and you would, it's some of the most profound conversations. And now we're in a moment where there's actually a lot of even books to share, like Ibram Zendi just wrote a book that's the children's book version of his stamped book, which is a very heavy book if you read the adult version. Um, yeah. I'm also in the process of writing a young reader's edition of my book. And I also am going to be uh, putting forth a picture book. Um, and uh, there are many, many others, A for Activism, and there's so much like little book just introducing these concepts and even introducing and being really um, honest with children. Like, you know, I've seen my sisters and I've done this with my own nieces and nephews who are younger, showing them, um, th you know, you've seen this happen on television and you, uh, they're, they're like YouTube videos where people show photos to their kids. Like here's a beautiful white girl and a beautiful black girl and asking their children, you know, which one do they think is more beautiful and, mm -hmm. and trying to figure out how they got to that conclusion. Um, you know, the, never be afraid to have these hard conversations or what you perceive to be hard conversations. I truly believe that the root of racism in America is that the younger we start, the faster we eradicate all forms of racism. I think that's very powerful. I also just want to mention, um, sorry to plug the festival, but on Tuesday, um, we're hosting a, an event with Carol Anderson for the Young Adult Edition of One Person No Vote, which talks about a lot of um, the history of voter suppression in America and um, a lot of the obstacles to voting that you were talking about. So I think that there are a number, um, and I'm so glad to hear that you're doing a young adult version of your book, um, because making those things accessible to children is is so powerful. And so, um, yeah, just just such a such an important um, feature. Um, the the next question that we have um, is um, very long, so I won't read the whole thing. But um, the one of the viewers tonight is worried that. Um, once Trump is out of office, one way or the other, um, that a lot of the resistance to racist and imperialist policies will stop um, through, you know, getting back to normal or restoring the nation or um, any number of euphemisms that we might use. Um, but 
this person's wondering how um, even when we see Democrats engaging in pro-war or anti um, or xenophobic rhetoric, um, how do we fight um, those things in, you know, the, the good side or the other side as well? How do we keep doing it? I really appreciate that question because it's a big concern of mine and it's something actually we saw happen before. If people remember in 2008 when and it was the historic election of Barack Obama. And you know, I was one of those people. I, I worked on the campaign. I cried that day. I was like, wow, look, I'm front row seats to history. And you know, Barack Obama was a constitutional lawyer. Um, he was an organizer from the South Side of Chicago. You know, he was Barack Hussein Obama. There was something about him that connected to who I was. And and you know, he was the change that we all wanted to see. And a lot of people put a lot of blame on Obama and the eight years that he spent in office and bring up a lot of the, you know many mistakes that were made during that time, you know, whether it be drone wars or whether it be the Patriot Act or whether it be, you know, so many other um, examples, you know, the, de the deportations that happened. And what I always say to people is I want you to step back a little bit. And for me, I don't actually bl blame Barack Obama. I blame us and our movement. What happened is we became dormant under a Obama administration. We immediately, he goes in, we all sat back. We said, look, this guy's a constitutional lawyer. He got this. Like, he's African-American, he understands oppression. Like we are all gonna just take a break now and we're just gonna let him do his thing. And that's a mistake that we make in politics. I don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican or if you're a progressive or a liberal or a centrist, you need a movement. You need people on the streets to build the political will for you. If Obama had mass mobilizations in the ways we've seen over the course of the Trump administration, he would have had to say, look folks, like what am I supposed to do with these people out here? Like these people are just not leaving me alone. We got to listen to what they mm -hmm. have to say. imagine if there was like a women's march type situation under an Obama administration, he would have probably took it a lot differently than a fascist. I mean, Obama was, you know, not perfect, but he wasn't a fascist. And so what I'm saying to folks is um, I'm I'm with you on the whole. I'm not doing this lesser of two evils things. What happens if Trump is out of office and everyone thinks that we solved, you know, world peace and we solved, you know, <laughs> I, I'm reaffirming here and I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to recommit with me here and to say I'm not going to be a bystander, even under a Biden administration. Um, you know, what I've been saying to people all the time and the way that I'm thinking about this election as someone who's a progressive and someone who, you know, and this is obviously not secret. I was a surrogate for the Bernie Sanders campaign. And of course, my candidate is not in the race and people supported Elizabeth Warren. There are people who support Kamala Harris and Pete Buttigieg and many others. And so I say to people, your candidate may not be in the race, but my question to you this election is, who do you want your opponent in the White House to be? Do you want your opponent to be a fascist or do you want your opponent to be a neoliberal like Joe Biden or a centrist Democrat? I would rather Joe Biden be my opponent and I'm willing and I'm ready. I'm fired up. This quarantine gave me the opportunity to reflect and build up my stamina. But on January 21st, when Biden is getting inaugurated, he's going to know that there's a movement ready to go after, uh, uh, under him. And Medicare for all, I'm not, I'm not taking no for an answer. If we're able to move Congress and get a Medicare for all bill on the desk of Joe Biden, it would be unfathomable that Biden would actually veto a health care bill. He's saying he would because he doesn't believe in us. So all I'm saying to all of you is let's not put it on them. Let's put it on us and let's get ready to organize January 21st, Trump or not Trump. That's fantastic. Um, uh, I also, I'm going to put their words in my mouth, but um, this, this person's question begins with you are our hero. Uh, we are some Arabs and Muslims here in Madison and they want to support you. Um, and how can they be part of your good efforts? I really appreciate that. Salam alaikum uh, to you all, um, and very honored that you have participated in this event this evening. You know, I'm a person that doesn't really like to ask for much uh, personally, um, but I think it's important, especially in this time and in this pandemic, that we are uh, uh, supporting our frontline activists in, this, in the respective communities that we come from. Um, you know, it's not easy out here. I always say to people, you know. Uh, we could make a dollar out of 15 cents. That's a 90s hip hop reference. But, you know, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's important for us to think about what are the organizations in our communities that are doing the work. And many of you know, I um, run an organization called Empower Change. And it starts with the letter M. I'm actually going to put it in the chat. Um, and it's an organization um, that I founded because I wanted, I, I was organizing for so many years. And just saw Muslims missing at a lot of tables and uh, saw a lot of Muslims missing 
at a lot of progressive tables around economic justice, racial justice, immigrant rights, and I wanted to bring our people to the table. Um, it's also an organization that has engaged in a lot of bold organizing. You know, we sued Donald Trump the day after the Muslim ban was announced. We organized the largest Muslim-led mobilization against the Muslim ban in Washington, D.C. on a Wednesday like 12 o'clock in the afternoon. We have registered thousands of Muslim voters across the country under a national campaign called My Muslim Vote. Many of you know that some of the highly, most highly concentrated Muslim communities in the country are actually in swing states. It's in Michigan, we're in Wisconsin, we're in Pennsylvania and we're in Virginia and we're in Florida and we're in Texas and we're in Colorado. And so for me, when I think about this election in particular and thinking about our My Muslim Vote campaign, if folks remember in 2016, someone like Senator Bernie Sanders wins the state of Michigan in the primary, which was a big political upset and it was at the hands of and the support of the Muslim American community. And then in the general election, you're not gonna believe this folks, Donald Trump wins the state of Michigan by 9,000 votes. There are 140,000 registered Muslim voters in the state of Michigan. So even if I could figure out how to get half of them to the polls, we could ensure that we can win this election. Same thing happened in Wisconsin. I mean, in Wisconsin, you know, we, we worked on Senator Sanders' campaign. He wins the primary in 2016, and then we lose the general. And I'm telling people that we have to mobilize and organize communities that for, for, for far too long have been left you know, behind. So I'd say two things. I'd say go to empowerchange.org and donate to our organization. Um, you know, we do general voter registration, voter engagement, voter turnout work, um, getting people out to local uh, elections and just kind of building power. Um, you know, doing advocacy around issues impacting Muslim communities, defending refugees, obviously working with families impacted by the Muslim ban. And of course, get my book. And there's a link from the Wisconsin Book Festival about my book. I always say to folks, you know, what, you know, getting the book for yourself, for your loved ones, for especially for, you know, young women um, in particular, mm -hmm. or, you know, if you're a not, if you're a Muslim, getting it for your friend who's not a Muslim, it's really a, really an easy introduction for people to really understand our pain and our story um, in a way that unfortunately hasn't been on television or hasn't been accessible. And you know, if you're if you're not Muslim, it's a great gift to give to your Muslim friend or any friend. Great gift. We have a long weekend coming up. I mean, you know, three days so people can read can read the book. Um, there are a number of ways um, to get it. Um, there is a link um, to purchase your copy from a room one's own bookstore. Um, there's also, if you'd like to get a copy from the library, we do have um, digital copies of the library and I put that link in the chat as well. Um, Linda, I did, I, I had my own uh, uh, question about um, the title and and so much of the title rings uh, true in what you have to say. Um, but I think that, you know, there's, there's an interplay between, you know, your picture and the phrase and, you know, knowing your, in history and saying we are not here muslims are not here to be bystanders but then um the way that you turn that and you say um it's such an eloquent way and something that i read all the time about it's not your problem or it's not you know whoever to pick a group it's not their own problem to become accepted and i just wanted to know how did you decide to really make that the thrust and to to bring any number of people white black christian muslim jewish into this conversation in that way um where one book kind of does answer a lot of those questions, those how do I get involved questions or how do I make this, you know, my problem as well. So first I'll um, actually tell you where the title came from. Um, and it's a sad and unfortunate story, but also an inspirational one. Uh, the We Are Not Here to Be Bystanders comes from a speech that I did um, at CUNY Graduate Center for a graduation back in 2017. Um, and um, it was, a, it, I shared the details in the book, but it was a very horrific time for me. I was being very viciously attacked and targeted around that particular CUNY speech. It was really crazy. Like I wasn't getting paid to do it. Um, the dean was a friend of mine. The CUNY graduate students wanted me to be the speaker. Um, it's a community college, you know, similar to you know Madison. Um, it's a it's a, obviously a graduate level. These are these are um, you know young people who have full time jobs and are trying to get a higher degree. We're in a working class, black and brown from New York City. So it was just the perfect place for me. I was just the perfect like. Yeah. It was a perfect package that they were going to get. And so what ended up happening is I got targeted by pretty much every celebrity in the alt-right, like and all the major celebrities in the alt-right, like <coughs> Milo Yiannopoulos, Gavin McGinnis, um, Robert Spencer, uh, oh my goodness gracious, Pamela Geller, um, 
oh my God, Mike Cernovich or whatever his name is. I mean, there was like a range. I mean, everybody, like it was like the an all-star lineup. And they, in fact, flew, flew all the way to New York City and they actually organized the rally outside the CUNY Graduate Center. Um, and it was called Cancel Sarsour. And it was funny because these are like free speech absolutists. And they're the ones that are always like, we're getting targeted on college campuses. You know, people are trying to shut down free speech. And here they are doing that to yeah. me someone on kind of the opposite side of, of, or their opposite political side. And so it was a really tough time for me. They were calling on CUNY to drop me as a speaker and, um, you know, because it was a tax, you know, a, a taxpayer funded school and how could they have someone like me and all this other drama that was happening. And, um, you know, I stood strong. There was like, a, it was crazy. It was like mainstream. I was in the New York Times. I was like, folks, it's a graduation. Like everybody simmer down here. And, you know, I was very grateful to our, you know, CUNY system, our city university system, which I'm also a product of. They stood their ground and they said, listen, free speech, this is academic freedom. She has every right to speak. She, you know, we have people who, uh, you know, are on the opposite side of her who speak at our schools all the time. And in that same time that I was going through all of this, uh, something happened in Oregon, in Portland, Oregon. And it was um, a... Bl young black woman and her Muslim friend who was wearing a hijab who were on a train in Portland and a white man um, was on the train assaulting and harassing them and these three young white men one of them was um, you know a, a army vet one was a poet um, and I can't remember what the third one was but basically young men who were probably coming home from school and slash work and some of one of them had four children uh, stepped in. They made a decision that day. They said, we're not going to be bystanders to this type of um, violence against these young women. And they stepped in on that day in Portland, Maine. And unfortunately, two of those three men lost their lives. Um, the the yeah. man who was, uh, who was assaulting the young black women and her Muslim friend uh, had a knife, actually, and he could have killed two young women. And these men stepped in and said, we're just not going to let this happen. So two of the men lost their lives. Um, one of them, Micah Fletcher, was a young poet who basically lived to tell the story. Um, and so I dedicated my CUNY address that day at CUNY Graduate School to them, to this idea of not being a bystander, to, of course, you know, being safe and, and making sure that your safety is also a priority, um, but never being a bystander when you see someone being, uh, you know, ridiculed, someone being assaulted, someone being yeah. harassed, even if it means yelling really loudly from afar, you know, distracting the situation, just making sure that you are and so that's where the title came from. And when I thought about, you know, the title of my book, um, you know, it, and, and, and I said, you know, I told my um, publisher, I was like, we are not here to be bystanders because not only did it, was it in honor of, of, of those three men um, and not only did it come out of my book, so it's part of a chapter in the book, it's really what I'm, I, 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 it crystallized for me. I was like, that's it. It's, I have chosen never to be a bystander. I'm willing to take whatever consequences come I have been vilified. I have been, uh, you know, in the mainstream press, in the right wing press. I have had all the experiences. And I actually don't talk as much about that in the book because I didn't want my book to be a book about, you know, victimization. You know, I wanted to be, to be an inspirational, powerful, empowering book. But I've been through a lot. And, 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 I, and it all stems from this idea that I'm not going to be a bystander. And I'm going to continue to stand up and, and speak truth um, to power. And so um, the cover of my book is also another thing. So here I am, I'm like, I'm gonna put, I had this vision that my cover was going to be a, a picture of Muslim women at a protest and a Muslim woman, you know, at a Muslim band protest showing like Muslim women. And my, my editor was like, yeah, that's probably a good idea, but, you know, and there was like a lot of going back and forth. And, you know, I kind of came, we all came to this consensus that representation is also important. So walking into a bookstore, into a Barnes and Noble or local, or your local bookstore and being able to see a cover with a woman like me on it. You know, I remember the first For time, sure. you know, when my book was uh, released on March 3rd, uh, my mom, um, who's an immigrant from Palestine was like, if it ain't in Barnes and Noble, this ain't real. So I said, okay, lady, let's go to the local Barnes and Noble, which is in Brooklyn and Park Slope. And we walked in and in our Brooklyn Barnes and Noble, they have a special section for Brooklyn. It's like everything Brooklyn, books about Brooklyn, things sure. about Brooklyn, whatever. And it was funny because it's the minute you walk in and here I was, I walk into Barnes and Noble and there was my book right there. And right down the street of our Brooklyn Barnes and Noble is a high school. Um, it's, it's a high school that I went to actually. And there's a lot of Muslim kids that go to that school. 
And so when I went to, when I went into the bookstore with my mom and my mom got really emotional seeing my book and my face on it in a Barnes and Noble. And it was obviously real. It was published. Like I got a book. Yeah. And I and I, I got emotional for a different reason. I started thinking about the little Muslim girls who would come into the Barnes and Noble because there's like a little coffee shop, Starbucks in there. Sure. And imagine just walking into a bookstore and seeing a Muslim American woman from Brooklyn on a front cover of a of a book. And I think that is also uh, something about my book too that people see themselves in it. Um, my community yeah. my community sees themselves in it. And um, I hope that. Um, for the, for those of you from my community who are it, part of this event, but also for others um, in our larger community, in the Madison community um, who are Muslim, I hope that I did you proud. And I hope that my book inspires you and reminds you to be unapologetic about who you are, that you belong here in this country, um, that we love this country. And one day um, after all of us deciding not to be bystanders, this country is going to love us back. That's wonderful. I think that's a great place to leave it. Thank you so much, Linda. Thank you for your time and for your book and um, yeah, for, for all that you're doing for Empower, the whole thing. So thank you so much. Thank you, uh, thank you to everyone who attended tonight. Thank you. Have a great night. You too.